Looking at this subject as a historian, it's a good game if you think, have we been here before? I remember the first book I read, or one of the first, when I came back to Hungary in the 80s, was called the Kate Theus Schoss Arnie Carbon, In the Shadow of the Double Eagle. And after 1711, the Habsburg Double Eagle descended on Hungary. Immigration from, they were called the Schwaben, uh, sorting things out, but very heavily Germanized. I don't think that parallel works terribly because in those days, Hungary needed to be recolonized in effect. It, it had been fought over for 30, 40 years in the, since after 1683, and uh, it needed change of various sorts. I think the parallel which you can make now is with the Habsburg absolutism of the 1850s. I mean, for, uh, for people not familiar with this, after 1848, the, uh, the Habsburgs had a sort of burst of energy. They mobilized the church, uh, they moved to the civil service, uh, and they started carrying out not political liberalism, but economic liberalism. You got laws about insurance, proper taxation, emancipation of the peasants, the serfs, all that kind of thing was a proper currency, free trade. All of these things done in the 1850s by the Habsburgs. Now they're foreign. They were a fancy uniform. They were Czech. And a Czech accent in any language is supremely irritating. Uh, and uh, they made themselves unpopular, of course. And eventually the system collapsed. Maybe if you think that Hungary is getting, at the moment, a dose of, we won't call it liberalism, but shall we say Germanic administrative methods, all this kind of thing, coming in through the European thing. Uh, no. Uh, um, it, you can't stretch that sort of parallel too far, but I don't really believe that um, country's character changes that much. And it's odd to see now how you're getting back to something like the politics of the 1930s, where there's a Betlin party, and there's a Gumbush party, and then there's a party of the extreme right. I'm not saying, of course, that Jobbik is something like the Arrow Cross. That would be absurd. But still, where is the left? It doesn't seem to be making much of a go. In fact, it's sold its headquarters, I think. I think you can say, uh, subject to what correction from Geyser, um, I think you can say that Hungary, understandably, was a bit naive about uh, the, uh, the joining Europe. I think um, she accepted certain things, which, looking back on it, you'd surely agree should have been fought against. For instance, the debt. Hungary had uh, the biggest per capita debt in uh, certainly the whole of the bloc, uh, and I think possibly the whole of Europe. Now that has been a ball and chain tied around your, ne your legs. If, as well, you get the dismantling of industry, some of which could have been rescued the Gantz Mavag buses and all that were, were well, they could have been adapted and, um, in some form or another. And if you have a wholesale economic collapse of that kind, it is, I think, very dangerous. I suspect, again, subject to what is being corrected, that the Czechs managed it a bit better. Um, it's a pity that these things happened. Now, um, another thing... I think um, it was a mistake. And I think Prime Minister Orban did very well to give them a shake. Is you accepted too much, um, you accepted the credibility of the banks too much. I live just off Calvin Ter, and there are three hideous buildings 
which should never have been allowed in a historic square like that. You should pull them down and hang the architects. <laughs> um, and, uh, there was, I think, too much uh, acceptance of, oh, these are Western banks, they know how to do things, let's accept it. I mean, Hungarians are immensely adaptable and learn fast and would certainly preserve Budapest, as thank God has been done, largely. That was one. Now, uh, again, uh, this is something which I must frankly say I do not know about, and it's agriculture. But if you look, uh, if you come across the border from the Burgenland to Chopron, uh, that part, the change in agricultural style is obvious. And uh, Hungarian agriculture has not taken off as by God it should have done. You make excellent wine, the possibilities for agriculture of getting back to the world of 1930 must be there, the soil's superb. Something has gone wrong with uh, Europeans and agriculture and I do not know what it is. Uh, in the 80s, you used to get Hungarian wine in British supermarkets. Not now, you don't see it. Why? And it's Hungary which needs to sell that sort of thing, not so much Austria or uh, wherever. Um, turning to uh, another somewhat contentious subject, um, uh, Giza Jasensky mentioned uh, a country which I obstinately call the Ukraine. I don't see why we have to omit the definite article in that case. Now, uh, the Russians faced sanctions over their taking the Crimea. Uh, now, I, I do not understand the international community in inverted commas. They take the letter of the law immensely seriously until you give them a cake. Now, the first country, I think, which gave the international community a kick in that spirit was India in 1962 when it took over Goa from the Portuguese. It just walked in and everybody said tut tut and carried on. Um, another thing which, since I live in Turkey part of the time, I notice, which is like a sort of fly in amber is North Cyprus. Um, the, the Greek Cypriots got greedy in 1963, made life difficult for the Turkish Cypriots. Then in 1974, there was a Greek civil war and the Turks wandered, wandered into the north to protect their own people and proclaimed a separate republic. It does nobody any damage. The Turkish Cypriots are not the Gaza Strip. Um, there's about 400,000 of them. More of them live in London. Why not just recognize the place and carry on with it? But Europe, in its wisdom, says, boycott North Cyprus, it doesn't really belong, and it kowtows to, of all people, the Greeks over an issue like that. Now, if you look at the obstinacy with which the international community hangs on to the letter of the law and translate it into a Ukrainian presence in the Crimea. Um, the Ukraine is perilously close to being a failed state. 90% uh, of the inhabitants of the Crimea don't want to join Russia, which will accept criticisms of Russia, but it works as a state. Um, why, why, why make a fuss about it? Now, the same is true of the, uh, uh, the eastern part of the Ukraine. Lugansk, Donetsk, all that. Uh, at first, when they thought that the Ukraine would be the favored child of the West, they opted for it. Then, as Ukraine fails, they want to join Russia. And since they speak Russian, why not? I mean, it, you know, uh, they are expected in Ukrainian schools, or were, 
uh, to read Bulgakov and Gogol in Ukrainian translation, this kind of thing. Now, at a certain point, they say, look, we want to join Russia. It's no doubt grubby. I don't pretend they're saints, but why not just recognize it and carry on with things? And the problem is that Hungary is required by these European rules to go along with the sanctions, which uh, exposes you to economic problems that you could do without. Um, the final thing which uh, I should say is, um, uh, in 1991, was it, uh, Margaret Thatcher, whose ghost is ever present here, um, um, held a seminar in her country house, Chequers, and she uh, invited historians, me, Trevor Roper, Tim Garton Ash, Fritz Stern, um, Gordon Craig, I think, to talk about Germany. And she got it in her head that there was some kind of Fourth Reich coming up. And she said, is it in the German character simply to march in step and, to, and do what their leader says? I mean, she was, she, she was a bit naive about this kind of thing. Uh, and, and we all said, oh, no, 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 uh, no, no, Germany's learned a lesson. It's a quite different country. Don't mention Hitler. It's absurd. West Germany is a model place. If I were a Transylvanian, I'd want to see a West German team turning up, clearing up the ecology, all this kind of thing. Um, and we all wagged our tails, and the West German embassy would have been delighted to see the protocols. But she was right. <laughs> what, really, what really got her was the, uh, the idea that the Germans would swallow a European currency, which she was dead against. And yes, um, uh, uh, that was the first thing. And the second thing was that uh, she, she suspected that there would be a certain kind of clumsiness and bullying in German tactics. Now, I'm afraid we've seen that. Uh, it, it was an extraordinary, irresponsible thing to do for Mrs. Merkel to say, come to Germany, dearly beloved refugees. I mean, I, I live in Turkey, so I have nothing against, uh, <laughs> nothing against Muslims or anything like that. Um, except I would say, how would the Turks respond if they were invaded by two million Mexicans? Um, and, uh, but it, what an extraordinary responsible thing for that woman to do. Uh, I happened to see, the ref I knew that the refugees had been tipped the wink uh, to leave Istanbul one night on their mobile phones, because I knew some of them, a minibus collected them, took them in the middle of the night to uh, Aydin, and they load, load up on boats. We got postcards from them from Paris the following week saying, we've got somewhere to stay, and we have been given 400 euros pocket money a week. Now, that starts, and clearly, uh, something had happened that the Turks had said, uh, we want rid of these refugees that we've got from Syria because nobody's helping us. So Mrs. Merkel responds by saying, oh, please come here. Then the Greek state collapses. Um, and they start trudging up to the Balkans. Uh, now, she never said, she never asked the Austrians or the Hungarians or the Croats, uh, what did they think? And you suddenly got invaded, I was here when it happened, by these trudging hundreds of thousands, and then criticized as terrible racists for objecting to it. Uh, Victor, did, Victor Orban did quite the right thing by putting up a fence. There would be another solution, which again, the international community is simply not going to find. And that would be 
to pay off Greece's wretched debt and take a long lease on one of these islands, a big one, and use it as a place where refugees could be processed. You'd have to do it. But the international community, let alone Europe, I'm afraid does not come up with imaginative solutions of that kind. Now, I'll, um, uh, I, I'll stop. Um, uh, um, it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure things will work out. Uh, it's not a good thing that you have 250,000 of your best people working in Germany and 150,000 in England. But at some point, they'll come back. At some point, there will be some purchasing power here. It's already happening. And Turkey and Hungary will, um, well, I hope you'll be able to get back, since I'm a historian, to that very happy time, 1867, when you get 50 years when Budapest is built up and Hungary is on the map again. So I'm wishing you well. Thank you.